All right, good morning, everybody. Um, are you going to advance the slides, okay. or do we have a clicker or anything? Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Adam Wood, for anyone that doesn't know me. Um, I have been a very minor part of a team of people that has been looking at Sanctuary, um, so even though I'm up here speaking today, I can't take uh, all that much credit. Um, but uh, I guess Angie, you, well, Angie and Laura and Steve and Joan um, have also been parts of, or been part of that group as well, and have, uh, we've been thinking about this for uh, several months now, and this is our fourth Faith Cafe session. Um, if I forget what I'm talking about, I was just telling Angie, I'm glad Dale made the announcement during worship this morning because I had forgotten that I was doing this today. Um, so it was a good reminder. But anyway, um, I'm going to give a little bit of a recap about Sanctuary and the conversations we've had uh, over the last few months. And then um, uh, we have Ruth uh, Lances, who's here with us today as well, who's going to speak a little bit, and uh, Angie's going to follow up as well. Um, this is just an outline of what we're going to talk about. I'm going to give a little bit of a recap and overview of Sanctuary. Um, Ruthann is here to talk about uh, what other congregations are doing, and then Angie's going to, as I said, talk about what we're um, thinking about proposing here at CPC. All right, let's go in. Okay, so what is Sanctuary? Again, so a lot of this is I've pulled together information from the other sessions. We've had uh, Sergio Gonzalez was here and gave us some good information. We have had um, other conversations about the legal aspects and some of the um, logistical things, and so uh, this is a summary of that information. So what is Sanctuary? It is, simply uh, put, it's physically housing people, um, a select group of people in a place of worship on a 24-7 basis. Um, the reason why it's important to do this at churches is because it really deters uh, Immigration and Custom Enforcement, or ICE, action. They have historically avoided uh, detaining people in sensitive locations, which includes churches, um, schools and hospitals. There have been stories though lately um, the last year or two in other states about uh, hospitals and schools uh, they're being detaining uh, or in immigration enforcement actions happening in those locations. So churches really are um, trying not to make a pun about being the last sanctuary, uh, but really are sort of uh, one of those uh, those locations that still are um, <clears throat> I wouldn't say immune, but a little bit less susceptible to immigration and custom enforcement action. Um, immigration is also really a public witness um, and, a, and a statement of faith. We're not going to uh, be able to house everyone facing deportation. Um, obviously not here at CPC, but even in the thousands of, or hundreds of, two or thousand churches uh, around the country that also provide sanctuary. We won't be able to um, house everybody, but what we, what we can do is we can make a public uh, statement of our faith um, that we are um, opposed to deportation of people for specific reasons. And go on to the next slide. Um, so why are we talking about sanctuary? What's the purpose of it? Well, there's, there's a biblical and a moral basis, and Sergio gave a really good overview of that, and, and these are just a few of the, the bits of scripture that he referenced um, about you know, welcoming the stranger, um, people being fellow citizens uh, under God, that you know, we're not... Um, <clears throat> There's not really a biblical basis about you know, getting proper documentation when you cross borders, but there is about uh, welcoming our neighbors and um, providing uh, the shelter that people are needing. Uh, secondly, the local immigrant community has asked the inter interfaith community to offer sanctuary. There's not been a need in Dane County for anyone to actually take up sanctuary at this point, um, at least not in this current era of sanctuary back in the 80s. There, there was uh, another sanctuary movement. But there has been this request that, uh, that faith, faith communities in Dane County start to offer this as an opportunity if it's needed, but also, again, as a, as a public statement. And you know, I'll also say that, that deportation is nothing new. Um, under the last presidential administration, we had one of the biggest uh, waves of deportation in recent history. Um, but what is different at this point is that there's this, this increased rhetoric that comes out from politicians as well as from, from various uh, groups that are becoming very active and very vocal around the country that has turned this into not just something about the legality but something also being a very anti-immigrant, um, xenophobic type of, uh, of treatment. 
So who would be the people that would be seeking sanctuary? Um, you know, it's, it's primarily individuals. Uh, we do see an opportunity for there to be some housing of families, potentially, uh, if need be. But it's primarily people that are facing deportation. They're kind of in a higher risk area, um, or, or higher risk situation, rather. Um, and they have been sort of vetted and referred to us by, or to a, a sanctuary congregation by a community organization. And a couple of those that um, have, have uh, become really part of this in Dane County are Vosas de la Fratera and Centro Hispano. Um, the Dane Sanctuary Coalition is really uh, an organization that has been trying to pull a lot of these groups together so that if and when somebody does need sanctuary, there's somebody that is part of the community, there's somebody that has been, um, you know, uh, uh, an integral pillar of the community and has a, a clean record, record, no criminal history, other than things dealing with immigration, um, and is, and is uh, considered to be somebody that is has a really compelling story. Somebody that can stand up and say, "Look, I've been here for 20 years. I've been paying taxes. I have a business. I have, you know, things like things along those lines that can." really indicate that these are people that are part of our community and have really been woven into our community for quite a long time um, so that it can be a, a successful um, uh, situation for everyone involved. So sanctuary, what it isn't, um, and I'll, uh, I, I like to start off uh, slides like this by saying I'm not an attorney. Um, but our understanding in talking with a lot of people, and Steve has been looking at a lot of the legal aspects, is that um, there's, cer there's certain things that we, that you know, sanctuary congregations, and if we become one, uh, wouldn't do. It's not harboring. Harboring is a, is a specific legal term um, that uh, is, is um, and I'm not going to try to explain well, that to you. I think the main aspect of it is that it is, uh, it has to have some connection with Encouraging the legal immigration to this country, it, it's, it tends to be mostly linked with uh, actually encouraging right. So, so for anyone that didn't hear that, Steve was saying harboring is essentially helping people to illegally immigrate and 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 hiding them in a, in essence. Uh, it's not a secure barricade. We're not going to deadbolt and lock the doors and keep law enforcement from coming in. Um, it also is not accommodating everyone at risk. Like I said, it's, we're, we're looking at finding people that have a compelling story that can help to uh, um, amplify this statement of, of that we are uh, trying to make as a, as a faith community in Dane County. It's not supervision. It's not necessarily that someone's going to be there babysitting somebody. They would uh, just be living in that building and um, using it as their living space. Uh, it's not necessarily providing for all the needs. Uh, a lot of the congregations, I understand, look to uh, have family members bring food, family members uh, bring clothing, do laundry, and so forth. Uh, it's really primarily about just providing a space. Um, it's also not all that we need to do, as we've been talking a lot as a group about sanctuary. Um, if we become a sanctuary congregation, it's a really good statement of our faith, uh, but it's not the only thing that the immigrant community needs um, for us as faith communities to do to help them um, and to act out of faith. I'm kind regard. of confused about the second one, like the uh, secure uh, barricade and what would a sanctuary church do if ICE comes knocking on the door? They have a little We will not obstruct. We will assert our legal rights if they have. There are immigration warrants that aren't signed by judge. We judges. We don't have to honor those. We don't have to just respond if they show up at the door and answer their questions or let them come in. Um, but if they have a legal warrant, especially an arrest warrant for a particular individual, we have we have to let them in. And we're not going to provide. You know, we're not going to have a getaway car in the back door. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. What if the person that's being sanctuary, sanctuary resists? How, how, do we, how would we handle that? Is this arrest? They, what, what if somebody that's, say, someone's in a, <laughs> in a building in a church? And, and under sanctuary and immigration and customs enforcement shows up to detain them and that person resists arrest. We would not aid in the vetting. Yeah, we, we would, would not, not be involved. 
Oh, okay. Just curious. <laughs> okay. Although we would provide a witness. I mean, there are right. there are instances where teams are available. You can have there's you, there are apps for your cell phone where a team can get a notice and assemble yeah. very quickly at a house where ice is shown. We could definitely have yeah. We could notify people people that are nearby can quickly come. We could notify media to come and see. It would be unprecedented sing, if... Sing hymns in the front yeah. yard you know, right. and, and things like that have been a deterrent, but you do not physically obstruct or get in the way. Because it would be unprecedented for immigration to show up at a church to detain somebody since that is not something that has happened in the past. So if it did happen here, by providing that witness, by calling the media, media would show up, the TV cameras would show up um, to, to record that and document that. Um, but that's a good uh, segue into implications and risks. Um, again, I'm not an attorney, but this is kind of our collection of information uh, as how we see things. First off, there's a, there's a bit of legal ambiguity that we would need to accept if we decide to do this. Um, there are you know, nearly a thousand sanctuary congregations. Uh, there's that 800 plus number count, I think is a little bit older. Um, but there've been, it's really doubled in the past year. So there are a lot of congregations doing this. Um, there really is only a handful of people across the country that are receiving sanctuary at this point. So again, a lot of this is about making a statement of faith, a very public statement of faith. And in the, um, the four, more than four decades that uh, churches have been providing sanctuary in this country, there have not been any arrests of any clergy or of any lay leaders. Um, there was uh, one lawsuit that uh, did occur and that involved you know, some of the things that we have just talked about sanctuary is not, it's not about transporting people, trying to get people, you know, across the border or anything like that, or smuggling people around. That's definitely where you get into a very kind of uh, clear violation. Um, there's also, uh, ACLU is, is really strongly kind of supporting the concept of sanctuary. They've been putting out legal, um, uh, I wouldn't say legal advice, legal fact sheets and so forth that you know, kind of demonstrates that there is a national organization that is very interested in furthering this cause. And I would point out to people here that PCUSA also strongly supports and advocates sanctuary and has lots of resources on the national website. You should go up there and they have very good resources. Yeah, for anyone that didn't hear, Steve was pointing out that PCUSA, the denomination, has a, has a strong support for sanctuary as well. That should be made known. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We do have their, their statement of support of it. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. but I mean, the general congregation, more of a presence of that knowledge, mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty important. Yeah. Okay, and um, so that's all I have with that. I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Ruth Ann to come and speak a little bit as well. Thanks, Ann. Thank you, Adam. I'm really fascinated by Adam's presentation because if I had given the presentation, I probably would have used the same slides. Um, and part of this underlines the fact that um, <clears throat> there are, what, what we're doing in Madison and actually nationally is exchanging a lot of information. And so it's like, you know, uh, you know don't do something that you, has already been done before kind of practice, right? So I really appreciate um, what you had here, Adam. It, it reminds me an awful lot also of how we started out, which I understand is very similar to how you started out, which was a presentation by um, Rabbi Bonnie and Sergio Gonzalez of the Sanctuary. And so um, let, me, let me kind of back up a little bit, though. Uh, what I'd like to do today are really three things. I just want to share a few of the steps that we've taken and share a few of the major concerns and issues that our congregation had. They might be shared by you also. And then also update you on where we are now. So um, as you know, uh, UCC in general, I'm from Orchard Ridge United Church of Christ. Um, I'm the moderator of our church. And so I stand here as a member of that church and also our, uh, the leader of our leadership team. And it's a joy and honor to be here. I, 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 you know, in fact, uh, I love it. One of the, one of the thrills of, of last summer was announcing the fact that our church was a sanctuary church um, at a press conference that we held. Uh, and um, it, was, it was well attended by everyone but the press. And, 
but Adam was absolutely on, on target when he said that when somebody comes to your door, that one of the first things that you want to do is not only contact your attorney, uh, or, and <clears throat> probably Centro Hispano and Voces de la Frontera, but also uh, make sure that the press is present and that you make witness to what is happening. Um, I also want to let you know that um, the fact that you house, for example, the, the law center, the Immigration Law Center, is uh, well known. Uh, I certainly am well aware of your work here uh, and in that area, but I can tell you the thing that I love most about your church right now is this view of the lake. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, 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 it's really outstanding. Anyway, uh, like you, um, uh, Orchard Ridge has, also has a long history in uh, a housing IHN, the Internet Interfaith Hospitality Network, and um, we also have a long history of uh, providing safe sanctuary for children, support of uh, gay rights, equality of the races, etc. We're active in many, many social justice activities. Uh, most recently, uh, in the, like, the past five years, five, six years, we've, we've also been very active with Habitat for Humanity, and that took us down to Latin America. Many of us uh, are bilingual, trilingual, and uh, love working uh, down in Latin America or South America or uh, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, etc. We uh, kind of a uh, a foreshadow of our decision was a trip that we took down that was sponsored by Border Links, which is an organization that you might be acquainted with. It's an organization based in the Phoenix area in which we spent a week down there uh, learning about immigration issues, uh, border issues, uh, saw what is termed justice, uh, the justice system in action, and uh, visited uh, with a number of people who had just been basically dumped at the border. and. Um, that we talked with after that in Mexico. We see uh, sanctuary, as Adam mentioned, that you do as uh, faith in action. Just a few things. I was, I was thinking um, last night about how I would characterize our process. And I decided that I would characterize it as transparent, inclusive, and short. Uh, for us, uh, we decided after, uh, particularly after we, after the election and after we became more aware of what might be happening with DACA, uh, that uh, we wanted to take action. And we wanted to take that action prior to the summer when things kind of slowed down at the church. And so uh, we moved ahead and immediately invited um, uh, Rabbi Bonnie and Sergio Gonzalez uh, for a session, an, an educational session. Uh, then we had, we invited an attorney, an immigration attorney to come. And then I think we did the most important thing in terms of uh, congregational learning and um, uh, comfort with sanctuary, which is we went back to something that I'm sure many of you are acquainted with is the old sticky notes. All right, the sticky note process, all right? And we asked people, we put up a great big board, all right? And we asked people to put on a sticky note any question that they had. We asked them to rate it on a, on a, a scale of one to five in terms of the importance that it had in terms of them voting for sanctuary. Because our process was that of having a congregational meeting at which our congregation voted for or against sanctuary. It was very easy to categorize the questions. Uh, they came out as legal, physical logistics, operational resources, collaboration with other organizations, immigration system in general, and other. So I would ask you to guess which one turned out to be the most important and had the most questions. I thought it was gonna be legal too. But, but I, I think that maybe because we had talked about it and it was so, such a common theme in our organization that we kind of jumped through that hoop, but it was, uh, it was right up next to operational resources, 
One of the reasons was because we wanted to make sure that we had enough volunteers available um, in addition to IHN. And as it turns out, IHN is going to be phased out. We didn't anticipate that, we didn't know that. But as it stands out, stands, IHN is going to be phased out, which of course also frees up many people who are very active in IHN and now who are very active in supporting sanctuary. Not that they didn't support it initially, but I mean in terms of you know being on board and being available to uh, house any person who is in sanctuary at a church. We also found that a really key uh, element <clears throat> of whether or not you are a prime candidate as a church for housing someone in the sanctuary is whether or not you have a shower. Uh, it sounds really silly, but when you can sometimes uh, look into the, the uh, behind the scenes decision of you know, why you did research somewhere or why you took this particular case or why you did that or something like that, sometimes it ends up to be some very, very practical thing. And for us, we've been told by many people, oh, you guys have two showers. You're going to be one of the first places that people want to go. <laughs> so anyway, um, we... Um, as you did, we, we did this series of educational sessions and then we held our congregational vote. Our congregational vote uh, was 99, the, the, the members of the church chose, 99% uh, of them uh, voted for sanctuary. Uh, the, the, the only dissension had to do with whether or not we were going to be what they call a supporting organization or whether or not we were actually going to house someone. It wasn't someone who was against sanctuary, it was just kind of to what degree we were going to be a sanctuary church. Since then, we have continued with educational sessions and we uh, have found that there was an incredible interest in the impact of the, um, on the dairy industry of immigration issues. Uh, one of the things, you, you, I see you nodding, you're probably aware that 80% of the people who are basically milking our cows, okay, are immigrants. And so we have had a number of speakers who have just really uh, been very informative in terms of uh, what's happening in the dairy industry or the impact that it would have on the dairy industry. Um, if certain things came about. Uh, in addition, there are people, of course, in the dairy industry from Extension who are very well versed and articulate in, in uh, talking about these things. Uh, in addition to that, we've had some sessions on what's happening in schools. We have lots of teachers in our, um, in our church. I happen to be a former teacher. I taught Spanish for many years and have worked as an interpreter and translator for the state. So uh, we had a particular interest in what's happening in the schools. Um, what we found was that uh, there has been an amazing amount of really, really good work done in the Madison School District. And I, w I have been very impressed by it. We had the director of Nuestro Mundo, uh, the principal of Nuestro Mundo, uh, Josh Forehand, who came and spoke to us about the work that they're doing there both in terms of helping families, for example, uh, set up guardianship plans or uh, other kinds of plans, you know, so that if the, the parents were uh, deported, that their children would, that there would be something in place for what would happen with the children. Um, other kinds of things are just information that's available through the Madison schools. At one point I subbed, for example, at Nuestro Mundo, and the first thing that happens when you go in and you sign in as, as a substitute teacher, right there at the front desk is information on um, immigration issues in the schools. Also, uh, in the, um, uh, on the Madison School District website, you're going to find some very good information. We're looking into having speakers um, on the um, landscape industry and other kinds of industries, you know, um, that uh, have a lot of people who have a questionable immigration or undocumented status uh, in, in their fields. We're also beginning to develop new operational guidelines. I shouldn't really call them new, though, because as I mentioned, 
one of the things you're going to find is that there's this incredible interdependency between all of the churches who are involved in this and the people who are involved in this. Uh, and so that's what I mean, like when you were speaking, Adam, it's like, oh, I think that follows what Sergio said. Or, oh, you know, if I put that together, it would be the very same thing. So our operational guidelines are very, very similar to those that are all that have already been developed here in Madison with Dane Sanctuary. Um, but uh, we are, I mean, every church, of course, wants to uh, make them specific to their church. And so, you know, we have tweaked them a bit. Um, and uh, we're in the process right now uh, because we think it's more and more imminent uh, that we will have somebody knocking on our door. Uh, a lot depends, of course, on what happens with DACA, but um, the situation is such, I think, that, that um, we will have somebody soon. We have also designated a space for the person to stay, and we have started uh, trainings According to the Dane Sanctuary guidelines, there are specific trainings that all volunteers will be required to take in order to be uh, uh, a, 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 a volunteer in the church with the person in sanctuary. Uh, they're, they're, they're very basic, uh, but they do uh, address the basic questions of what you do, for example, if somebody not, if ice knocks at the door, those, those sorts of things. In terms of learnings, I thought I would mention just a few things. One of the things that we learned, and as I look back on it, and as, as I mentioned earlier, was that transparency was really key, uh, both uh, with, within our leadership team, within our congregation. Everyone knew what steps we were taking, where we were thinking. We involved our entire congregation in that process. We found there was a need to provide opportunities at church for people to talk privately with one another and also to have public sessions. One of the big things that we learned is that this is a real, this is a real test of people's uh, ability to deal with ambiguity. Um, that uh, in so many areas and in response to so many questions, it's like, well, if this, if that, uh, there are so many questions that uh, even the people who are undocumented, defining their exact status is a big issue. So um, there, when and if a person is going to be coming to your church in search of sanctuary is of course an issue. Uh, you know, who's going to be doing the cooking if somebody comes? That's an issue. And so you get into these operational questions uh, that often turn into a kind of, uh, well, we think we'd do this if this, right? So uh, we found it really fascinating to see that there, everybody has different areas in which they're most comfortable and different areas in which they you know, have difficulty dealing with ambiguity. I guess uh, the final thing that I would emphasize that I already mentioned uh, in passing is the need to feel that, for us anyway, it was the need to feel that we are not alone. Uh, one of the joys of being involved with this whole thing has been getting to know the people who are involved in this movement. It's a dynamic, it's a wonderful, it's a caring, it's a compassionate, it's a fun group of people. Um, getting to know, in particular, people with uh, Voces de la Frontera and Centro Hispano, let alone the people from the other congregations, has, has just been a real treat. So I think I'm going to stop there, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to take the last little piece, and this should be pretty short. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, remind you a little bit about the process we've had at, at CPC and what we're thinking about going forward. Um, so, you know, we've already heard about, um, you know, Adam had already kind of reminded you that we've had, this is our fourth session we've had. Um, these are all, well, the, the last three have been recorded, um, and we're working with Cindy Benish to, to post them on probably, um, like, making a, CPC um, YouTube channel. So those will hopefully, hopefully be available within a few weeks. Um, we unfortunately did not record the first one, which was the, kind of the overview. 
Um, I but notes from that one, though. OK, we can try to make those available, too. Um, and we do have slides from the um, biblical and historical basis and the, this one, too, which uh, we can certainly make available if anyone is interested in those. Um, and then going forward, the next slide. Um, what we're planning on doing is we're planning to bring a proposal to session for a vote in January, the late January meeting. Um, so we're still pu we're putting together, we'll probably be adapting other churches' materials and for the kind of statement that um, that session would actually vote on. Um, we are planning right now at least to recommend that we, we become a hosting congregation. And what we're thinking about um, logistically, is, um, and this is... Um, We've had a lot of conversations about this, but we're still kind of figuring out details. But we're thinking the catacombs seems like the obvious choice. It's out of the way. It's not used. Um, I know there have been concerns with uh, water leakage. Dale have been concerned about that in the past. We talked to Carol, who says that that actually is not, that's been fully addressed, so that should not be an issue. It's obvious if you go down there, it's a pretty dingy place. Um, so we need to paint. Um, we, we need new lighting down there um, at a minimum. We kind of figure we can probably get donations. I mean, I, I, will, I will buy paint. <laughs> Just someone will buy light bulbs. Um, and some, some, I mean, I'm guessing we can get probably donations for all the furniture we would need down there. The nice thing about that room is that there's, that re there's a really big closet off of there where if you did have a family, you could make that a kid's bedroom. Um, it's, a, it's a large space. It's not super well lighted. Um, you know, there's, there's the, the one window kind of in the, the I know what you call the window well stairs down there. So it's not a great, it's not a, the best place, but it would work pretty well. Uh, there's a bathroom attached right there. There's a shower one floor up. Um, so that's sort of what we're thinking logistically um, would make the most sense for that. Um, and we would not be, as Ruthann was saying, we would not be doing this on our own. Um, and I know, I know Dale has some concerns about the financial cost. And I think the intention is that the congregations are not expected to be paying for the people to live there. Um, that there would be a lot of fundraising, there'd be other, other um, groups and other people who'd be supporting paying for meals and you know, getting volunteers to pay for meals and various other things. So um, the like Madison Christian community has a great four-page handout, which we will also try to make available. Um, and you know, they, I'm going to talk with the pastor there too, and like, they expect this is not a big financial outlay for the, for the congregation. Um, there are currently 12 congregations of all the Dane Sanctuary. Um, last I've seen, there's six who are hosting congregations, including Orchard Ridge. Um, and there are six that are supporting congregations. So we would have support from those congregations as well, as well as um, seven other groups uh, last I saw on, on the web page, which you know, including Vistas La Frontera and um, Santo Espano and various other, other groups. So there would be a lot of other support to do this. Um, that said, it's still, it's still a very big undertaking and we're still in the process of kind of nailing down. I think everyone's still in the process of figuring out what exactly this means. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and we have time for questions for any of us here, including other people who have been working on this. And uh, how much time do we have? Uh, it is uh, uh, 10.57. Oh. Ooh, so. <laughs> So we can say a little bit. I mean, yeah, we, 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 should, we should stop. Want to go second service? We'll yes. officially stop if we're happy. But we can say other questions. Yes. So anything on right now? Yes. What is your sense of when this would be utilized for the first time? Right. Very hard to know. Um, like, like, um, like people are saying, no one has actually asked for sanctuary in Dane County yet. I think some people. I think there have been some conversations with people who are wanting to know about it, who are kind of preparing it, like thinking about it. Um, and I know Rufan said that she anticipates that there probably will be someone sometime soon. Um, the thing too is that the, the person who's looking for sanctuary people have a choice. They can kind of look at the different congregations and choose which one they want to stay at. Which, which you know, each congregation will have their own requirements too. So, like Temple about Al is thinking about it, but they would want they're a kosher building. So they're trying to figure out if they did host someone, would they require the people to keep kosher? And people might say, I don't want to keep kosher. I don't, I don't want to stay there. So each church can have their own set of requirements, and the people get to choose whether they, which one they want to stay at. So. And Mary, you had a question there? I was just thinking that when we then was talking, I think people know this, but like um, the way our church governance is, my understanding is session vote. Yes, on session vote. We're not taking a vote of the country. Right. No, that's just the way the public yeah. management works. Jimmy? Um, but to, to that point, I, it does seem like it would be good if the congregations knew more. And, you know, obviously, 
Any final comments before we stop the recording? No, stop it. Okay.